You're listening to the Armchair GM Sports Network. This is Rod Mahood, your in-game voice of the Niagara Ice Dogs, and you're listening to the Dog Pound Podcast on the Armchair GM Sports Network, your podcast source for all game analysis, team interviews, and up-to-date news regarding the Niagara Ice Dogs. Perlini! Overtime! Ice Dogs win! Hosing! To a kill Thomas. Welcome into the season finale episode of the Dog Pound Podcast, the official podcast of your Niagara Ice Dogs, proudly brought to you by Global Pet Foods, where pets are undeniably part of the family in all four of their great Niagara region locations. Brandon Caputo and Cam Halbert are with you as we hit our summer break, our final episode uh, before the off season. An exciting one, though, leaving you guys off uh, with something really well, really good here. We're going to have a special guest, Stephen Ellis from Daily Faceoff, is going to come on, talk to us about Kevin He's draft year, what he, where he expects him to go in the upcoming NHL draft, as well as Ryan Robrick's impressive rookie season, a little bit on Brady Wasslin, who just went in the first round to the Niagara Ice Dogs, and as well, we'll finish off with a couple of uh, questions from Cam regarding general O. OHL prospects as well. So guys, make sure to give us a follow at Dog Pound Podcast on X as well as Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all that fun stuff. And thank you to those today who are watching us on the video version on YouTube. Make sure to hit like, hit subscribe, and smash that bell. And if you're listening to us today on your favorite on-demand audio platform, thank you very much for doing that. So Cam, I know you're pretty fired up. Uh, good friend of Stephen Ellis, uh, you were able to make this happen to facilitate him to come on. I know he's got a, a busy schedule now that the World Championships are ending and, and the NHL drafts upcoming. But uh, really looking forward to hearing what Stephen has to say about, um, I guess, the outlook of the Niagara Ice Dogs and and what people outside and and draft uh, you know experts think of where the Ice Dogs are at the moment. No, absolutely, it was awesome. Uh, I've been friends with him for a couple of years now, and uh, he is. One of he he watches the most hockey out of almost anyone in the industry. Um, and you know, he works for with or works for Frank Saravalli's uh daily face off and has really become one of the top prospect uh journalists for covering hockey and obviously a very busy time of the year for him coming up with the draft this summer. Uh, but yeah, I'm excited to uh hear his takes on the ice dogs and specifically Kevin He and and you know way down the line Ryan Rubrick. So excited to excited to talk to him. So we'll get you to that interview right now. Here is Steven Ellis from Daily Faceoff on the Ice Dogs upcoming draft class and a little bit about the organization and the OHL itself. Welcome back to the Dog Pound Podcast, the official podcast of your Niagara Ice Dogs. Brandon Quito and Cam Howard are pleased to be joined today on our season finale episode going out with a bang here before our summer break and uh, good timing. We've got Steven Ellis from Daily Faceoff. Uh, obviously with his work with the prospects and everything like that that he's got going on on Daily Faceoff. Uh, before we get started, Stephen, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. I know you got a lot of other hits to do uh, this week, and you've been busy with the World Championship, so I uh, appreciate you coming on and uh, draft time, uh, you know, a fun time of the year. Yeah, you guys rock, so thanks so much for having me on. I'm pretty happy to be here. <laughs> awesome. So with that said, Stephen, obviously this being the official podcast of the Ice Dogs, we're going to start off there uh, with, with some of their players, and, and most notably, Kevin He. It's his NHL draft a year, uh, just uh, just finished that up, uh, and he's going into the NHL draft with high hopes. Where do you see Kevin He kind of slotting right now? Where do you have him in your rankings, and, and what impressed you from uh, the Ice Dogs uh, number 11 this year? I think we're looking at a guy who could be a third or fourth round pick. You know, the, the thing that obviously stands out there is the speed and watching him very closely in his OHL draft year. That was evident from day one. That guy can fly. Uh, it, was, it seemed like he was always smiling, having a good time too. It seemed like the teammates that he, no matter who he lined up with, just got along with him really well. So there was that. Um, very agile skater. Uh, very good on that. Uh, his puck control is awesome too. I think, you know, you see him on the rush there and, 
he could control it. He's got good hands. Uh, he finds open space really well, things like that. Uh, I guess the kind of the, the, I would love to see him shoot more because I do think he's got that the good shot there. But when it comes to just what he does uh, with his feed and, and how he can drive the play like that, I know that's something teams are looking for because you need to be able to skate in today's NHL. And that's the thing. You can see guys who have this the skill, the the shot, the physicality, but if they can't skate, they can't keep up and, and teams aren't interested. Uh, with with Kevin, it's it's you can clearly see the skating there is is one of the bigger elements of his game and it makes him uh probably I'd say one of the better skaters in this draft class. What do you think? Um, I, I totally agree. He's been one of the more fun skaters to watch, not just from an ice dog standpoint, but just from in the OHL. When it comes to a mid round pick, um, obviously after like the first and second rounds, there's a big drop off in the chance to make the NHL and things like that. What does a mid round pick have to do to stand out in after they've been drafted in the OHL from your uh, perspective and, and what you've found throughout the last few years, what do they need to do? Is it just like point per game? Is it like a physicality thing uh, for them to get a, a real shot and move on to, to maybe be a pro? I think when it, when you're not like a star prospect, when you're not a first rounder, I think the key you're looking for is finding ways to make yourself more useful outside of, you know, if you are a one dimensional player, trying to find something that makes you a more well-rounded player, because, you know, everybody wants to play in the top six. And if you're playing in the top six in your junior team, you know, that's great, but so are so many other players in so many different levels. So you, there's so many spots to compete with there. And if you're a guy who's not a, a 60 goal score in the in the ohl you're not a superstar you might end up being a bottom six player so you got to find ways to be valuable there whether it be that work ethic whether it be the the hockey iq whether it be the defensive play you know coaches love guys who are smart and commit defensively especially if you're a forward there so being able to kind of really round your game out and make yourself so valuable in different situations uh, one example of that is is cole Baldwin of the, uh, the Barry Colts, you know, guy put up some pretty good numbers this year, but what we saw in that second half was him blocking shots, hitting guys, doing all those things that make him so valuable. So finding roles like that, it, that can show to the coach that they can put you in different situations. That versatility is going to go a long way. And when you talk about Kevin, when he was a 16 year old, he tied Akil Thomas for the franchise goal record as a 16 year old. Ryan Robert broke, broke that this year, which we'll get into. But it seemed like Kevin, he was one of those guys that was one of the more genuinely players in the league last year. And this year, he added a little bit more bite to his game. He was getting in a little bit, few more scrums. He was getting more penalty minutes, uh, as Cam and I alluded to this year. Um, what have you seen from Kevin? Maybe is that something that scouts were looking for as far as seeing a little bit more of that fight and tenacity from him? Uh, we know he's a respectful guy off the ice, but um, adding that uh, portion to his game to to make that uh, more translatable to a pro hockey career. For sure, yeah, because again, like you look at that, and I remember watching him really closely at the OHL Cup, where he only had one point, but I thought that he still created a lot of opportunities there um, for North York, and then he gets drafted, you know, I thought last year he had a pretty good rookie season, obviously the 21 goals looks great there, and this year again, he put up 31, but he had to show he was more than just a guy who can skate and, and, and score and the fact that he was willing to get a bit physical whether it be during a play whether it be after the play you know teams like that guys who are again going back to just being more well-rounded it's someone who's willing to stick up for their teammates willing to kind of take players out of their their headspace those guys are valuable so yeah that is something i know i was looking forward to, to hope seeing him kind of improve that level and, and i thought he looked pretty good there when it comes to this, more of a, a broader question in, in terms of um, OHL teams and the Ice Dogs specifically, uh, he it, it, if he is to get drafted, which I, th I think we can assume that he's going to be, uh, he'd be the first drafted player since I believe Tomasino uh, from Nashville. How big is it for a team that uh, has struggled in the standings over the last few seasons uh, to get a drafted player in the NHL? Does it really add a lot in in terms of scouts coming out or or just other? Uh, other players that are on the team getting more looks uh, to potentially be drafted? 
For sure. You know, when, when you got one guy, like I, I know an example is you look at the London Knights and everyone was kind of keeping an eye on, on Sam Dickinson this year, but then they were like, Oh, well, Sam O'Reilly's pretty good there too. And <laughs> that, that opportunity I think is really interesting. And uh, I got an article coming out kind of on, on guys who are more underrated players that are, are going to potentially get drafted. And then one here is I, I, I've never actually had to say his last name out loud, but uh, urban Podrakar. Yes. Yeah, urban Podrakar. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Portugal. Uh, so he's a guy that I know scouts are looking at here. And, uh, you know, I, I've got an article coming out soon about how part of it is, you know, we don't see a lot of Slovenian players drafted. Mm-hmm. So that's very cool. But, uh, you know, I think people are looking at his smarts, the way he moves the puck and are actually quite impressed. And uh, so so opportunities like that kind of open up when you watch um when, when you go and see a guy that everyone that's kind of on everyone's radar and it, it helps obviously being the OHL because there are so many scouts in this area and so many of those same scouts were following guys at the GTHL level and kind of saw them grow. But then you go out there and find guys you may have not seen and, uh, you know, a player coming from Slovenia last year to come play in the OHL. That's a bit of a culture shock, but uh, that's kind of a situation where there's, there's ripple down effects that are, are positive. Yeah, and there was definitely a lot of some scouts there to see Kevin, and, and like you mentioned, uh, the ripple down effect uh, could help other players, and especially uh, when Kevin does get that NHL affiliation uh, this coming June. As we shift gears a little bit here, Stephen, I, I want to bring up Ryan Roberg because not a lot of people, and in, in, including us, uh, we, we because of his late September birth year, yeah, uh, birth date, we did not realize that he is was not draft eligible till twenty twenty six. So pretty incredible that he started the season uh, when he was 15 years old, um, and he obviously broke every Ice Dogs rookie record that there was as a 16-year-old and as a 17-year-old for 17-year-old rookies. Um, really, you know, res- uh, reset the record books here in Niagara. Early projections. What have you seen from Ryan Rubrick? And I know you have a funny story as well. Yeah, well, I'll start with the funny story. So last year, watching him at the Whippy Silver Stick tournament, and I, I want to—I can't remember which team it was he played. I want to say it was the Mississauga Senators, but I might be wrong. And uh, you know, at the, t- at the time, I'm like I was saying to a scout, I'm like, man, I really wish we could see a bit more from Rubrick right now. Like he's such a skilled player. I've watched him so many times. I want to see him score. MT Net from his own zone takes a wrist shot bar down. You don't see that every day, uh, <laughs> no. but that just kind of shows how good of a shooter he is. And um, you know, I, I watched him back when he was playing the U16 team, London Knights, a couple of years ago, and there was the talk of the exceptional status. He didn't get it, and uh, Michael Misa did, and I think that kind of just showed, like, you know, there was an argument to be made there for sure. He was physically dominant. He obviously put up a ton of points, 34 goals, 63 points, and like I think it was 27 games. Uh, I don't know why I remember that, is that number. Um, but he uh, just going out there and in can controlled the pace of play and then i think some people were kind of hoping to see a bit more from him last year he still scored 51 goals but it was like okay can he put that effort in every single day and i think what we saw this year was you know that effort was there he he's motivated he had to prove to himself like yeah i i'm one of the best prospects uh, in the ohl like i i'm trying to chase a high draft spot in, in 2026 and the fact that he is younger gives him a bit more of a runway uh you often see guys who, you know, might only become a top line player in their second year in the in the uh, OHL, and for him, he's going to have a lot of extra time to play those key minutes and be a big part of the team as they continue to move forward. So, um, him going out there and getting fifty one points this year as a rookie, outstanding numbers. Um, it's just kind of like, hey, let's let's see the help he gets the next couple of years. Is he someone in his draft year we're talking about? Uh, 60 goals, 100 points. I could see that happening. So uh, it is going to be a bit, but I guess that also kind of is exciting for uh, uh, for Niagara fans where in that third year playing there, all the eyes will be on him there and, and he'll be kind of at the top of his game. Yeah, what do you think the ceiling is in terms of like his placement before this season happens? Let's say, you know, it just goes as projections, you know, it's the way too early 2026 draft. You know, what how what is the potential in terms of what you're hearing and, and where he could potentially go again way too early? Definitely very too early, uh, but I'd say the one thing for sure is we're looking at a guy who's going to be fighting for a top 10 spot. And that's crazy. because he's been just for a, a few years now, he's been kind of near the, the top of, of rankings. And uh, it's the, the physicality for me, the way that he's kind of just built, you could see a guy that's just there to to really make some noise and and get in the way. And 
uh, you see the numbers and it's only going to get better from there. So um, right now I'm not have a ton of concerns about his game. Again, I was like, let's just see that F effort every single night. And I think we saw that from him this year in as that team kind of looks to push forward and, and be a, a serious contender for the championship in the next couple of years. Like, that's going to be even more motivation as if he didn't need any more. So uh, I think that we're, we're talking about a guy, at least at this point, that looks like a top 10 prospect. What would you like to see from him in his second year? Obviously he had a great 16 year old campaign and, and broke every rookie record that Niagara had, but from a developmental standpoint, we know he's going to put up points, but what would you maybe like to see him, you know, take a big step in as he goes into his second year. And then obviously he's going to have a, another full year before he's drafted. But uh, what would you like to see from Ryan Roebrick as, as he goes into his second year with Niagara, a team that's continuing to try to build and develop back into a competitive uh, program? I think it's kind of still just one of the things that from his OHL draft year, I, I just want to see him continuously moving his feet, continuously pushing to, to really be a nuisance out there, be someone who takes away space, be someone who gets in someone's uh, grill and, and tries to annoy him out there, out there, because again, you, you see the puck skills, but let's see, let's see him just round out those other elements. And because we know what he can do out there, we know that he can go out there and, and, make someone really mad and we know that he can shoot the puck we saw at the u17s when he shot it went in so uh i think that uh that's going to be just continuously showing that um that, that you that he's committed like if he could be a the one thing about players that i like uh, especially goal scorers are the ones that kind of have that fourth line mentality of like i need to continue mm -hmm. to prove why i kill thomas had that Exactly. Akil Thomas yeah. is one of those guys where you want to prove that you want to be here every night. You want to be in the lineup and you want to play like your career is on the line every single night and 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 put in that effort in. If he does that, again, there's not a lot of flaws in the style of this game out there. So that would that help a lot. From a team standpoint, uh, in terms of what you see as a successful OHL team, um, you know, outside of drafting high and, and hitting on your picks, because obviously that's extremely important. But what is something that you think that all OHL teams need to make the playoffs? Because we honestly, I think as, uh, you know, as Ice Dog fans, we'd be happy with the playoffs. But I think in two years, we're going to be like, hey, let's see a little bit of a run here because the window is usually in about three years. So what's something that you see in common with all of the OHL teams that are at least playoff contenders? This sounds lame, but scoring depth is really huge. Um, obviously, you, you go and look at the London Knights and, and and what they were able to do during that championship run against Oshawa, and it was just, you know, not having uh, Beckett Seneca really hurt the Oshawa Generals there. They didn't have one of their biggest weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, London probably could have sat Easton Cowan, and they were still going to find ways <laughs> to score. And and the depth there is really important there. And you, you build that from the draft. You try to find some hits in the, the second, third, fourth round, maybe later. You make some trades, obviously, at the, the deadline. But it's just kind of making sure that you have a minimum of three lines that are going out there and can put pucks in that. And then that fourth line, maybe it's just going to be the hardest working group out there. And, um, but, but again, kind of just going to the, the hardworking side, that sounds pretty basic, but you'll see a lot of players, especially as teenagers that just might not put in the full work ethic. They might've spent the last 10 years of their hockey career, just putting up a ton of points mm -hmm. and all they needed to do was stand in the right spot and score. But if you can go out there and, and fight for every single puck and win those battles. And then you've got that scoring depth. You're going to be a difficult team to play against. As we shift gears here a little bit, Steven, uh, I've got a couple more minutes with you here. Brady Wasslin, uh, a guy that the Ice Dogs just took fourth overall in the 2024 OHL draft. They obviously lost the lottery um, to the winter spitfires and weren't able to draft uh, that big power forward, Nathan Belchess. But from all you know, tens and purposes, it seems like the Ice Dogs almost lucked out here because they got a guy in Brady Wasslin that some scouts had as the best overall talented offensive player. So what have you seen from Brady Wasslin in his draft year with the Marka Majors uh, coming into the OHL, and how do you think he's going to translate? Uh, uh, the Ice Dogs have had a couple of solid 16-year-olds in a row here with Ryan Robrick and Kevin He. so he's got uh, some shoes to fill with those expectations. But uh, what have you liked from Brady Wasslin, and what do you expect when he gets into his first OHL season? Well, I asked the scout at the OHL Cup. I'm just like, what What do you see about Wasslin here? Because there was talk about who was going to be that number one prospect. And a lot of people had Wasslin as number one. And 
the thing that kind of just kept being mentioned was he's the guy that you build a team around. He's the guy that if you need a goal late in the game, he's going to go and do that. And he did that often with the Toronto Marlboros this year, uh, or, or sorry, not or Toronto Marlboros, uh, the uh, Markham majors. And the, I think the thing that hurt was the majors weren't part of the OHL cup. They weren't part of the, um, the silver stick tournament. And so the opportunities to kind of really see him step up against other high level competition was kind of, you know, harder to find. But I think that the more we saw him really play out there, trying to lead that team, like he was the backbone of that majors team. And uh, he's got a great shot again, puts that work ethic in. He, he plays that two way game. He could play center. Uh, he could play wing. I'm, I'm going to guess maybe he plays in the wing in, in the OHL. I'm not totally sure what, what happened there, but the, he's got that versatility that I was mentioning that you want from these prospects who find so many ways to stay valuable. He plays the power play, plays the penalty kill. And that's, a you know, obviously doing that in the, the U16 level where in the penalty kill, you're often just still putting out your best players. Um, that's, that's a totally different thing you might see in the OHL. But I think he just showed that he was so competent in all of that that he's going to have no issue adjusting his game to the the OHL when he gets there. What do you think was the reason why he fell? Obviously, I think Bel- Belchez was, um, you know, physically just like it's tough to ignore. I mean, he is massive for a fifteen or sixteen. I don't know if he's turned sixteen yet. Um, just obviously for to, to when he went first, but is do you, do you think it was a mistake by the other franchise the other the other organizations and uh just kind of fell into the, the ice dogs lap uh, i'll say the ice dogs i think just got a steal here um you're looking at there's always a lot of questions about the ohl draft like who's gonna commit to the ohl who's gonna go elsewhere i think the the, the, the not being able to participate in some of those bigger events definitely didn't help his his situation there. Some teams I know were just looking for guys that they knew they could build around in certain situations. But with Wasselin going to Niagara, like that's that's a huge boost. That's a win. I I was surprised he fell to fourth, and I know a lot of other people were too. So um, sometimes teams just find a guy they really gel with, they feel can fit a perfect need for their team. And uh, I think for Niagara, you've got a guy who can be your your maybe your number one player in a year or two and uh, him having him and rubric as the two guys you build around. That's, that's huge. Definitely exciting uh, for ice dog fans before we kind of shift gears for the last couple of questions about general HL stuff, Steven, is there anybody else currently on the ice dogs? Uh, maybe some of the younger players that maybe has caught your eye that uh, maybe isn't on the radar right now, but if they have a big season this year uh, might, might be somebody that be turning some heads uh, for scouts. Well, I definitely like Frolov when I watched him play at the OHL uh, draft level. I thought that was a guy that looked uh, just really smart with the puck, and it's just kind of a matter of time before he really puts that up. But I think the good thing about this team here was they really prioritized getting getting these young guys to play a lot of minutes. We saw that with um, you know other teams in the CHL. That was the thing where you look at uh, Metis, or, um, Moose Jaw, where they were putting uh, Braden Yeager and giving him a lot of ice time early on, and the idea was – eventually we are going to try and be this really like we want to be one of the top teams in the league and we're going to be willing to put these younger guys into situations where they can develop and you look at how many 07s played a big role this year for that team and i think that's kind of a good sign that you know it was a learning year for everybody there and and by the time that these 07s are kind of at their their peak ready to go like this team should be pretty competitive so um it's a matter of time, I think, until we're talking about a bunch of guys here that are uh, getting some NHL draft interest. Absolutely love that. Um, going towards this draft, this upcoming draft, obviously, a lot of uh, OHLers uh, projected to go in the first round. Again, my first year covering the OHL and not just as a fan, so I uh, got to watch hockey at a, for, for a different lens this year. Um, one of the things, this is, I'm going to do some bold takes. I'm going to give a bold take of mine, and I want your opinion on it. I think that it would be a mistake if Sam Dickinson does not go before Zane Parekh. Oh, uh, yeah, I have that. That I have Sam Dickinson at number four in my rankings, which I think is higher than most people. And I, yeah. there's an argument to be made. He could be the second best player in this draft. Not yet, but you don't get guys that are six foot three, move like him, and do all that stuff. And we're talking about a guy that the biggest concern I think for scouts heading into the season was, was he going to be able to put up points on the board? He didn't do that last year. How does 70 points sound? That's Mm -hmm. pretty good. I'd say so. uh, You've got kind of a guy who could do a bit of everything. Like I, I love him as a player. He had one of the best slap shots. I what we me and Brandon talk about this a lot. The ice dogs really lacked uh, their power play. We just struggled so much this season and they lacked a guy 
that can just hammer the puck on a one timer. And um, we we saw London the very first two to first two games of the season. And Sam Dickens just seemed like he had one of the better one timers, at least in terms of like power. But the problem was that Holtonen, who I like to call the finish Danny Healy, was legitimately just hammering the puck every single time on the power play. But his shot was just so obvious and he was very safe defensively. And I, I don't I want to make I want to be clear. I don't think that Zane Parekh is like is a bust or anything like that. I think it, he just has a massive floor and ceiling. Like or a, a low floor, very high ceiling. I think I and I, I the few times that we got to see him. He has an edge that teeters on like a, a little bit dirtier. Um, and, and sometimes I don't think that translates when you go pro and you're going up against you know, men. Like, you know, just they're massive, right? Where you can't really get away with that in the OHL. So that was that was my take there. But I, I feel like I see a lot of projections uh, from people. And that was one that I would see is that Parekh is kind of ahead of Dickinson. I, I think that that would be a, a mistake. But I'm probably I, think a there's, Rolf. I think there's a higher ceiling for Parekh as you see, mm-hmm. like the numbers he puts up this year. Yeah. Oh, just to kind of change the topic quickly, Casper Haltonen is one of my favorite prospects in mm-hmm. hockey. That guy can shoot the puck, mm-hmm. man. It is, and he hits, awesome. and he's mean. It's awesome. Um, but when watching with Parekh, you you see the numbers again there: two thirty three goals, or and like almost a hundred points. But he's also got over sixty penalty minutes, and yeah. He is kind of he's willing to to get in your face. You know, he's he's so competitive. He's one of the more hyper competitive players you'll find in the top 10 this year. Um, defensively, he's not at Sam Dickinson's level. Yeah. And I think the thing to keep in mind is we are talking about defensemen. Yeah. So they do need to play defense. And correct <laughs> is better defensively than I think he was maybe in October, November. But it's not at Sam Dickinson's level there. And that's kind of the, the differential there for me. So I think but, Dickinson might be the better NHLer. Parekh might put up the more points. And I just, but again, the, I think the ceiling is higher for Parekh. Right now, I'm taking Dickinson, though. All right. What's your hot take, Cam? Oh, oh so my the hot take is uh, Ryerson and Leander seem to be the best goalie drafted. <laughs> every time, and now this is tough because every time the Ice Dogs played this saga this year, it was like they every game they were in it, but my goodness, I don't think I we saw a goalie at all that just refused to give up rebounds. He was always in position. It was so frustrating, uh, and, and I just it, he was definitely every time that we saw him, it was like, oh man, we're gonna need we're gonna need some luck here. So I I think that he would be the best goalie. But I we were talking off of air, and I think that you might disagree. You your maybe your opinions have changed because we talked every time that they played the Ice Dogs. I text you, yeah. and uh, I don't know. Let's hear it. So like I, I was very high on leaders early in the year, and I I did drop them pretty heavily in my rankings. And part of that is, you know, I was hoping to see what he do with the U 18s Well, he wasn't the starter there. I was hoping for a really good second half after a great first half he wasn't the best goalie on the steelheads in the second half. Yeah. And I think that's part of the issue there where they've got a guy in Jack Evan Kovic who could be a first round pick next year. Uh, like scouts are that high on him as a goalie prospect. And how rare is that by the way, to an OHL team multiple to have that. goalies taken next year in the first round. Yeah. Now, it, it's early. Um, but there's a goalie out in the WHL. That's just going out, just nuts on a, on his own there. And I, I think that, yeah, it's definitely rare. Um, I, I'm not totally sure how deep we're talking here for that 2025 draft for that to be a, a conversation. But I think with Leanders, you know, not a huge goalie. So he has to beat everybody with athleticism. And we saw that at the CHL top prospects game where he was great in that game, looked awesome. And uh, I still think is gonna he's going to be one of Canada's goalies in the future at the World Juniors. I do think he'll be an NHL goalie. It's just I'm not sure I see starter potential in him mm. there because he doesn't have that size because he doesn't have uh, like he, he does have a, the, 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 and unfortunately does allow some goals a little weaker down low, but really nice kid, great family. And I, I do think he's got a good future. It's just, I don't know. I almost feel like this year's goalie crop, you like Marcus Gidloff out of Sweden uh, is someone that a lot of teams are talking about right now, a six foot six goalie that played in the SHL this year. Maybe he's the first goalie taken. Maybe you're taking a guy out of Finland, like Emil Vinny. Maybe you're taking Carter George out of Owen Sound. Mm-hmm. Almost every scout I ask, I, when I talk to you about goalies, they gave me a totally different top goalie. <laughs> yeah. That's the purple. Mm-hmm. There's no clear number one. So, Steven, as we let you go here, as we hit our off season, Ice Dogs were 18 points out of a playoff spot last year. So, Kevin He getting drafted, Ryan Robrick taking the step in his second year, Brady Watson hoping having, uh, hopefully going to have a, a solid rookie campaign. Like, what is your expectation for the Ice Dogs next year? Is it 
getting into that seventh or eighth playoff spot? Like, what what do you see as a, as a su- successful season for a team that hasn't been to the playoffs in four years? Well, you're still building for that future, and I think you got to take a big step forward. You can't be 18 points out of the playoffs. You got to be. If you don't make the playoffs, it's got to be like a miss by one point. But I think you expect expectations to be high for this team next year. Yeah, you want the goaltending to be good. You want the defense to be hard to play against. You want to have all these scoring weapons. And I do think next year, you know, having another year of Kevin, he, after what he did this year, is going to be big, especially after the draft, you're going to have Ryan Rubrick. You're expecting big numbers out of him. Like there's going to be more weapons for this team than we had seen in the last couple of years. So uh, I do expect a big step forward. I think success is making the playoffs, maybe not winning a series, but you're still getting that experience for those guys that you are hoping the year after or the year after that, that you're ready to go for the, for a championship push. So uh, it has to be a big step forward. Stephen Ellis from the Daily Faceoff. Stephen, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, speak for both Cam and myself that uh, it was great to have you on for the analysis and and give us some some exciting stuff as we hit the off season and looking uh, towards the 2024-25 uh, Niagara Rice Dog season. I'm sure our listeners and viewers enjoyed it as well. So thanks so much. And I got to give you guys a shout out. You guys do such <laughs> a great job. It's good to see the, the you know some great coverage of a of a OHL team here in this league and it's it's great hockey it's a great league and it's it's good what you guys do so thank you so much appreciate that buddy in the Niagara region global pet foods is your destination for premium pet nutrition and caring expertise whether you've welcomed a new furry family member or need advice on top quality nutrition their dedicated staff is ready to help Discover why Global Pet Foods' lesser-known premium brands outshine the big corporate names. Their team's passion ensures your pet's health and vitality. Check out one of their locations today. 3643 Portage Road in Niagara Falls, 160 Highway 20 in Font Hill, or 400 Scott Street and 344 Glendale Avenue in St. Catharines. Global Pet Foods, where premium brands and caring staff make the difference. Jane L. Flooring is Niagara's specialty flooring and design company. They take great pride and provide elite customer service and support. With a beautiful showroom, great pricing, and a wide variety of truly unique products, JL Flooring is your specialty flooring and decor boutique shop. All of their products are environmentally friendly and responsibly produced so you can feel good about your flooring choices. Their goal is to build authentic relationships based on honesty and integrity that they foster with respect and authenticity. Offering a unique and wide range of quality products presented by a knowledgeable and patient team, they simplify the process to make your life easier and to make your home more beautiful. Visit them at 4424 Montrose Road in Niagara Falls or find out more at jnlflooring.com. If you think you can get a better deal anywhere else, you don't know Jack at JNL Flooring. Niagara Golf Lounge features two state-of-the-art indoor golf simulators allowing you to play some of the world's best courses all year round. The perfect place to indulge all season long. Don't worry about getting thirsty while you play around with your friends. Their fully stocked bar offers a wide selection of drinks, appetizers, and a variety of meals are also available to enjoy before, during, or after you play. Grab a seat next to the fire in their comfortable sports lounge. Didn't bring your clubs? No problem. They have partnered with TaylorMade to offer you the best rental clubs. You won't want to miss their exclusive NFL and NHL giveaways for the Buffalo Sabres and Buffalo Bills. Located in the Best Western Plus Cairn Croft Hotel, 6400 Lundy's Lane in Niagara Falls. Visit NiagaraGolfVacations.com to learn more and to reserve your golf bay today. The Niagara Golf Lounge, Niagara's home for golf and sport all year round. Wild Bill's Auto Repair is your local center for auto maintenance and repair in the Niagara region. Since 2012, Wild Bill's Auto Repair and Body Shop has been helping customers stay safe and confident on the road, knowing their vehicles in top running condition through their services. Located at 7868 Oakwood Drive in Niagara Falls, the garage started as a tribute to the owner's father, William Robert Hunter, who passed away, continuing the same community spirit and high level of service which customers came to expect from him back at Hunter's Auto Repair. Their multi-award winning auto shop has earned the trust of the Niagara community with its fair treatment of all customers who can feel confident they'll get the trustworthy advice and repairs during their visit. Their experienced crew loves meeting new people and looks forward to forming a lasting partnership for the care of your cars. To find out more or to book a service, contact them today. 905-358-7868 or wildbillsauto.ca. Wild Bills Auto Repair, helping customers stay safe and confident on the road since 2012. Are you looking to hire? Let the Niagara Employment Help Center save you valuable time and money by making your hiring process easier. 
Their services include free job postings in-house and on their website, fill job vacancies quickly and efficiently, access to a bank of potential employees, reduce employment costs, and financial incentives may be available to offset the cost of new hire training. Check out the website at ehc.on.ca or call 905-358-0021 for more information. The Niagara Employment Help Center, helping people find work since 1983. This is Alex Asadorian. Hey, it's Ryan Roberg. This is Ivan Galianoff. This is Gavin Bryant. And this is the Dog Pound Podcast. The official podcast of the Niagara Ice Dogs. Welcome back to segment two of today's Dog Pound Podcast season finale episode right here on the Armchair GM Sports Network, the official podcast of your Niagara Ice Dogs, probably brought to you by Global Pet Foods, where pets are undeniably part of the family in all four of their great Niagara region locations. Brandon Caputo and Cam Howard are back with you. Cam, that was a great uh, segment there with Stephen Ellis, giving us some stuff to sink our teeth into as far as what to expect from Kevin He in uh, as he approaches his NHL draft uh, it did this June, Ryan Robert going into his second season, a little bit on Brady Wasslin. And uh, I know you were asking about Ryerson Leanders and a couple of defensemen, Zane Parekh and Sam Dickinson, who I can't believe was brought up on this show. But regardless, <laughs> I know, <yeah. laughs> um, Cam, initial thoughts or reactions to uh, Stephen Ellis's uh, thoughts about, let's start off with Kevin He because he's obviously uh, the, the main point of topic right now. Well, it's nice to hear someone other than us that's outside that covers the industry kind of uh, mirror what we say and what we've been seeing all year round and kind of justifying those claims that Kevin looks to be a an NHL prospect. And he's uh, I can all but assert, uh, assume he is definitely going to be drafted this summer. And I just think that it, it's so big. You heard him talk a little bit about how big it is for a franchise, an OHL franchise, because you're just going to have more scouts in the building. You have people, whatever team that, you know, uh, that Kevin goes to, obviously they're going to come out and take a look and and see what they've got in him. And that just kind of trickles down down. I think one of the more interesting things was the fact that he brought up Padre Car, which we didn't expect. Uh, he had such a good year, um, but we didn't really anticipate, you know, him being on the radar of some uh, of of some uh, you know NHL drafted draft boards and things like that. So uh, again, really interesting takes on on um, on Kevin, and uh, you know we've got a potential top ten player or first round pick in in rubric if all things goes well in, in the following year's draft. So. Uh, just uh, love to hear that from from someone who's uh, so highly acclaimed in the industry. Brady Waslin as well talked about mm-hmm. maybe he might be the best player on the team in a couple of years, which is pretty incredible given That's that Kevin crazy and Ryan Robrick are here. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, he's got uh, big shoes to fill for the the f- following in their footsteps for sixteen year old rookies. But uh, <laughs> yeah. I think uh, you know maybe maybe this one uh, will be v- very good as well for Brady Waslin. He did mention Artem Frolov as well. Yeah, and, and again, I'm what I'm so excited about. I mean, obviously, we've been away from the team for some time, and when you don't make the playoffs, that's the one downfall is that we we don't get a playoff run and we don't get extra games, so uh, our season kind of ends early. And I'm just I just want to skip ahead to October and just see the 16 year olds and how they play in their second year. We had to rely on Zada, Rubrik, Galianov, and Frolov so much that um it was so much for 16 year olds and it was just kind of unheard of but they did so well in their own right and i'm really excited to see we talked about this a lot like i'm I'm just really excited to see zada because i think that he out of the four he's got the potential to make the biggest jump we know rubric is going to put up points maybe i would assume 30 goals i think that's a safe floor for rubric if he continues developing the way that he looks to be developing but zada he looks like he has the potential to be one of those players who makes a giant offensive jump um, in his second year. We see that a ton. I mean, if you go back and look at Gavin Bryant's point totals, right? In your first year as a 16-year-old, you're just trying to get comfortable. And Zotto was thrown into the fire, had to play center. Most of the time near the end of the year, was second-line center for majority of the season, especially when Acid Orion was hurt. Um, I, I think that we've got a shot to see him really mature and, and kind of make the biggest leap year over year. Um, but then again, yeah, looking at, you know, second years of Frolov and, and Galianov, like just uh, I, I I really want to skip ahead to the beginning of next season because I think that uh, uh, there's a lot to look out for. And that we haven't even discussed, you know, the draft class this season, because for the first time in four years, it seems people out that cover the OHL outside of the Niagara Ice Dog organization 
have a buzz, like a little positivity about the ice dogs. And I think that's huge for the fan base. I think it's huge for the players because of the rough seasons that we've had over the last four years. The fact now that you've got pundits in the OHL being like, man, the ice dogs had a really good draft and it just kind of, you know, there's hope like real hope now. And, um, you know, I think not making the playoffs, even as an eight seed would be a massive disappointment next year. And you talked about the rookies, all four of them signed. Brady Wasslin signed, Max yeah. Crete, uh, Matthew Humphreys, and Nick Frasca, their four top picks. Uh, Frasca and Humphreys as third-round picks. Max Crete is a second-round pick, and Wasslin the fourth overall pick. There was a lot of good buzz about uh, Maximus Crete as well. We've talked to him on this show uh, as well for our draft coverage. And, and a lot of people, as you mentioned, outside of the organization saying that Magra did a good job with their top picks, getting Wasslin, getting Max Crete, and... Obviously, Frasca is going to be a depth defenseman to start, but with his uh, you know bloodline and lineage there, uh, with all of his brothers being solid OHL players, you expect him to be uh, an impact player at some point. And Matthew Humphreys as their developmental goaltender. So I think with their top four picks, they really hit on uh, the areas that they needed to address the most. No, absolutely, and I think they were still in a select the best available um, part of their like development. But this year is all go, and I think what I'm what I'm very curious to see is much like last year, uh, maybe it wasn't as much, um, uh, not fanfare, it's not, not the right word, but expectation where last year, the first four picks outside of Robrick and Zada, really, um, it was like, okay, these are four starting at OHL players immediately, but then Frolov and Galliano became, and they were great, and they were great uh, for what they needed to be. This year, it's like, are they all, like, obviously, the draft class, not just from us, but from outside has all been all been told that they had a really good draft class. But they, I don't think they can all make the team, you know what I mean, and be starters because of how well last year went. And you've got a lot of lineup decisions that are going to be real interesting, especially out of camp, because we know head coach Boudreau is going to give the players that work the hardest and and perform the best in in, in training camp a shot. It is not just you got a high, you got picked high, you're automatically on the team, you know, or, or going to be starting. It, it'll be interesting to see how things shake out and, and how the lineup kind of shakes out, uh, especially with some other overage decisions that they've got to make. Yeah, I mean, they're going to have a ton of 16- and 17-year-old players because you look at last year's draft class, that's four right there, mm -hmm. possible four this year that have signed. So that's eight 16- and 17-year-old players already that are going to be on the team, not including maybe some of those call-ups like Dianov and Eric Key and, and maybe some other players as well. So uh, we've got a quick just projected lineup here for 24-25 yep. that I got up on the screen for uh, you watching the vi the video version on YouTube. And again, we're not kind of going to kind of put the rookies in there yet because it's unfair to say what's going to happen at training camp. And we don't want to speculate on who's in and who's out there. But uh, you look at the the three OAs at the moment, Gavin Bryant, Owen Flores and Ryan Vanetten. You think that that might change because you would assume that the Ice Dogs are going to address maybe the decor is the biggest uh, thing that they're going to lose. They lost, obviously. Uh, their, their heart and soul back there in Federco. So they need a guy to kind of replace him in that sense. When you lost Ride and you lost Sobolev, it really took a lot out of that decor. So mm -hmm. you'd, you'd think that maybe a move or two would be upcoming uh, when the uh, the offseason officially opens up after the Memorial Cup uh, for GM West Consorti to go out and make some moves on the back end. And, and you'd think that uh, the Ice Dogs, at the moment uh, of this recording, that lineup is going to look different uh, come August or September. Absolutely. I think that we, we talked about this as well, that in the cycle that they've got, um, because of he and Rubrik, well, I mean, Rubrik doesn't really count because technically he would be drafted with Wasson his draft year. He's got a, a lot more years because of his early his early birthday, which really makes things interesting because, again, we, it's just such a bonus for the Ice Dogs, have him having such a, a late birthday. But their forwards seem to be coming together, but defensemen, they don't really – I don't want to say they don't have time to wait – but since they went uh, high overall picks on forwards, Zada Rubrik, as well as um, as well as uh, Waslin now, I th I would suspect that the players that aren't able to make the rosters, we again, you can't assume that all the rookies are going to make the make the the starting lineup. But I would hazard a guess that Waslin and maybe Crete are going to make the lineup. 
right out of right out of camp. That means that there's some interesting players that are going to be pushed down because I don't think that they would make the team on like the fourth line or something like that. Maybe Crete because he the, his game seems to suit like the bottom six and just that rough like you know four check, very aggressive that kind of thing. But I look at players like um, Paris and Levin. Great, had they had great offensive seasons for the Ice Dogs. Are they facilitated and, you know, and, and helping out trying to find a defenseman? You know, again, it's all just speculation. And we're just playing armchair GM. Um, but it, it, there's going to be some there's going to be some interesting things that are going to have to be done, because I think if they want to make the playoffs, they have a lot of good defensemen that will move the puck. Frolov and Padrakar aren't going to get worse. And we can assume that. And why the only issue with him is that he has had an injury history. So it's how much can you rely on him playing a full season? Those are all very good puck movers, which is very important. But and you've got Chanowski and, and DeWatcher and Van Netten still. But I think they're missing that, you know, Sobolev or um um or Federko. Like they need a, a guy that is gonna hammer you if you if you try to, you know, get down the boards, something like that. And I think that's where a trade is gonna come in. Again, as you get a little bit older, I think that this team would benefit from having overage defensemen just from the look if you were just remove the names and just kind of picked where you'd want it just because they're older bigger that kind of thing um would it would help out the team the most but we'll have to wait and see because uh, we have a lot of uh, overagers like bryant's not going anywhere uh, with that uh, there's no way he's so good he's been a great captain and then you've got uh, Van Netten as an overager as well and then flores as, as too so the flores situation is interesting uh, especially with uh, the drafting of Humphreys, who is going to get some time uh, to develop, but he's big. Like he looks, he looks good too. Uh, and Robertson had that great finish to the season that really made his question like, man, is it okay? Like, how is this going to go? But Flores has just been such a competitor that I don't want to see him go anywhere. Um, so a, a lot of questions about the lineup, but it's exciting because this is the first time where talent is forcing the issue, you know? And we saw the issue of having not having enough bodies that were OHL players, regulars, right? Like putting DeWatcher and Eric Key in the lineup, it was great for them, uh, but I don't think they were ready yet, you know? And maybe this year they are, right? A little bit more ready to, to be able to handle what, what the, the rigors of a season, but there were so many times the, the Ice Dogs had to play undermanned, and you've got these four new players as well as four rookies that – I think it's a benefit where if Frasca doesn't make the lineup immediately, and maybe he will, to be honest with you, he, he might make the out you know, of training camp, but you know, I think they've got some options now and it's uh it's really exciting. Mike Potalu is also an X factor too, because he's an OA as Forgot well. I, I, I did not put him as an OA and he is an OA as well. So it <sighs> depends on how he recovers from um, his injury that, uh, you know, plagued him for most of the season. And it was such a shame because we saw so much potential in him going into the season. He was clearly the fastest player the out there. And, uh, you know, they got a decision to make on him as well. So I think other than Gavin Bryant uh, as a shoe in, I, I think the rest is going to be to be determined mm -hmm. because Flores, we don't know if, if he might uh, might go elsewhere or uh, move on to the pros. We don't know. Um, Ryan Van Netten and as well, Mike Potalu, like those are decisions that are going to have to be made. Evan Klein still in the he would be in OA as well if he would were to be brought back. And I, I just. You know, don't see it at this point because of uh, the talent they have up front. Uh, uh, using an overager on a on a player that played on the fourth line for most of the year, so yeah. it's uh, it's tough. But like you said, it's almost a good thing to have because you you assume that a trade's coming at some point for like a, a rugged veteran defenseman, maybe not even an overager, maybe a guy that's you know eighteen yeah. or nineteen. But uh, you, you'd expect them to to go and try to fill that role that Federico is going to be sorely missed for uh, on that back end. But you've got so much talent up front that it's going to make for a very competitive training camp. And we might see some, you know, a surprise cut or two uh, or, or somebody traded after the uh, training camp just because of the, the numbers, but it's good to have organizational depth. And as you mentioned, we saw last year, the lineup was just too depleted at, at multiple times. So this is a good problem to have if you're head coach Ben Boudreaux and, and the management staff as well. No, absolutely. And I want to be clear. I don't want Levin or Paris to be traded. Just looking at the roster, um, if if Waslin and Crete were to make the team, I, I you know, obviously for their development, Waslin specifically because he might be a cornerstone player, as is Crete, but there's more expectation with Waslin just because of the, the draft capital. Um, you obviously want to give him high minutes. And, and head coach Ben Rudrow isn't um, 
afraid to do that. We saw that when when Zada and and Galianov had great games at center, he they were literally the first two centers, you know, and um, in, in for a few games. So he is definitely someone that will reward play regardless of age and things like that. So um, I just think that if Wasson performs in training camp, like he could be a high end winger on that second line, uh, assuming that Rubric and he are the on the first with, with Gavin Bryant, but we don't know. Last year we assumed out of training camp that it would have been Lavoie, he and Asadorian. And we, I don't think we even saw that line maybe one or once or twice. And we just assumed that was it. We penciled that in and then training camp comes and it's completely different. So um, this team and West consorting did such a good job. I, I like, I can commend, I commend him because the prior year, it was just so much about trying to land the mem cup. It felt like, and, and just trying to team wasn't winning got a trade like just they were just trying everything and there's uh, you know you can respect that and this year it was a much more concerted effort to build a team and keep it together as much as possible and some of the trades like i think went really well i think you know the bronson ride trade for example um i think that they they did very good job in that and um i would suspect that there is at least two or three that have to be done here again all based on what happens like i think if crete shows up and is awesome in training camp then a forward is definitely being traded just because I don't know where, you know, you don't want to have him on the, on the fourth line. I don't think, I mean, it, you, it would be great for development standpoint, but it, it'll just, it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. They signed all four guys right away. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and again, there's going to be some X factors depending on health with guys like Mike Potaloo or Andrew Wysick that were out for most of the year last year. So again, there's still a lot of questions to be had yeah. here. Uh, by the time we probably come back uh, to, to record again, but it just gives us some good things to, to think about and try to piece together a lineup and, and it gives you good discussion about thinking, okay, that, uh, you know, the lineup isn't just going to be set. Like there's going to be moves here and there's going to be guys that are going to be challenging for uh, forward spots on this team this year. And it should be a very, very competitive training camp with a lot of top end young prospects trying to, you know, assert themselves into this lineup, not just be given spots. I think that uh, the, the big thing this year, like we, we, the year that just happened was it was the first year we started to see some building blocks and not just from rubric and Kevin, he having a better year and, and getting, you know, drafted potentially. Um, but even from the management team, you know, they, they made very few moves. They tried to keep the core together and then they, and the few that they did make seemed to be good trades and, and well-received in the room. Uh, and then getting, you know, head coach Ben Boudreau in there to, to really lock things down and give the, the team some stability. He's been great. Um, he really seems like he is going to get the team to gel and work hard uh, and rewards players for working hard. And I think that's huge, but I think as a fan now, Last year, it was like, just stay relevant for as long as possible. And that was a good expectation. But this year, it's like, make the playoffs. Like, it's within, I think that they, they've they got enough. The, the management team and the, and the coaching staff has done a great job at building this team. That I think that now, 7th or 8th spot, I don't care. But I think that Ice Dog fans should expect, I think that's the expectations. I think making the playoffs this year is, is definitely an expectation. And, uh, and then that following year is, you know, it's going to be, I'm very excited to see if rubric has that continued development because you get a, you know, a high end first round NHL draft pick. You're going to get some eyes, especially in Canada on, on the ice dogs watching rubric in that draft year. And <laughs> that'll be Wasslin's draft year too. No. Yep. So like it all, it all snowballs, it all snowballs. And, you know, the prior years where players didn't commit, talked about Sam Dickinson and, and the ownership prior um, to Dobler. Like it just it, it's been a few years of just, man, the offseason was tough. And this year is the first one where it's like, man, this well done, you know, and I think that as Ice Dog fans, um, we should be really happy about it. But we deserve a, a great run. And I think we're going to get a, a really good season upcoming. Want to yeah. get it started now, though. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely. um a lot of trial by error in that first year. And I think the second year, as you mentioned, uh, didn't have as many peaks as valleys. It was trying to be a more, more stability throughout the season. Again, a team that was 18 points out of a playoff spot, 
but you could say up until the trade deadline that at least they were in the conversation for a playoff spot at that time. I mean, they were only five or six points out and they were still in that hunt. And then when the trade deadline happened, uh, when they made a couple of those trades to to unload like Sobolev and, and Ride and things like that, it uh, the, the team really tailed off in, in Lavoie as well. But um, you, you saw that this team could compete. We saw in the first half of the year how many tough games they were in, a couple of big wins uh, throughout the season as well against the Kitchener Rangers and the North Bay Battalion. And you'd assume that there's going to be, when you look at the the standings real quick uh, here, Cam, and I got it up on the video version, there's going to be some turnover in the Eastern Conference this year. And even within the Ice Dogs mm-hmm. division, the Central division is going to be very interesting next year because you look at the North Bay Battalion, they had three kicks at the can now, unfortunately losing in the Eastern Conference final all three years. You'd assume that That's Adam Dennis tough. and his group are probably going to have to recoup some draft picks they could have sold this year. Um, but uh, you'd expect them to take a step back, possibly. The Mississauga Steelhead should take a step forward. The Sudbury Wolves, you don't know what they're going to be this year. Um, if they're going to have That's... to sell off some pieces or if some of their top end guys like Dvorsky and Musty end up going on to play pro yeah. hockey. So there's possibility that the Ice Dogs, I, I would assume that them and the Peterborough Peets are like right there. Um, they're still both very young teams, but if the Ice Dogs can leap over Peterborough, all they have to do is leap over one more team, whether that be the North Bay or Sudbury's if they do decide to go elsewhere or another one of these uh, these teams in the Eastern Conference like you don't have to go that far when you look at it. You only have to leapfrog two teams, and one team is very beatable in the Peterborough Pete. So when you look at that, you'd say that it's very encouraging going into this year for the Ice Dogs that there's going to be opportunity for them to at least move up that one or two spots that they need. 100%. Like That's the thing that, o- that Ice Dog fans need to remember is that um, the OHL operates in like three-year cycles, really. Three or four-year cycles if you're lucky. And unless you're Nor London. Bay, yeah, Nor Bay. Yeah, unless you're London. Nor Bay went all in. And uh, to to like a, a crazy stand, almost like what happened with Windsor the prior year when they traded for Shane Wright and basically, you know, they went from first to last, well, second last. And I think you can see a similar fall in North Bay. Um, the Ice Dogs are probably in year one or year two of that, right? And, you know, now North Bay is going to be in their year zero. So it's like that that's a very possible thing, which is crazy because North Bay just did such a good job against the ice dogs this year but as you know ty nelson my favorite player to watch so far he won't have, hopefully won't have to deal with him anymore that's uh that 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 uh i believe uh i don't believe he'll be on the team next year so um but uh yeah then you've got the the Pete's as well i mean they, they there were stretches where the ice dogs almost caught them they caught peterborough and peterborough again is in its year zero year so um they're going into the year that the ice dogs had the prior year so you know with some luck i think that the the power play like, that's it. That's really what it is. If it goes to 10 to 15%, like from 9 to 15%, which would be still below league average, I think, um, we're looking at like 10 points right there in the standings. So uh, here's hoping. They've just got to pass two teams to get into that eighth spot, and obviously you don't want to get in that eighth spot. You brought up Sudbury. That's a, they were a very top-heavy team, and you know there's a real chance that Dvorsky as well as Quinn Musty make the Sharks and the Blues. And if they lose both of them that's like awfully tough you know and but they still have an ohl team like a, a very good roster but i obviously wouldn't be enough to do what they did this year go ahead but as we'll, well see and go yeah go ahead as well so uh that'll be interesting. i think the I, the steelheads i think will will have another very good year I, I would yeah i would probably expect them to lead the eastern conference um you know with that goalie tandem and misa um, so we'll see, but, uh, no nope, things, uh, things look up for the ice dogs. It's different now because last year we talked about, I just said, I said it from the beginning of the year as a fan, just be close. Cause it was over in November of the year before, right? This will be like, um, the fans will be frustrated without a playoff run this year, just because the team is set up so well. So we'll see what happens. But before we wrap up, I know you wanted to talk about Ryan Robrick made the all rookie team mm-hmm. in the Ontario hockey league. The first team, uh, all rookie uh, team uh, there with, with, with some of the other talented uh, rookies there in the Ontario hockey league. And as Stephen Ellis mentioned, it's just going to be a fun two years uh, to see Ryan Robrick's trajectory. But uh, you know, just as we look back on it now, uh, this might be a rookie season that we look back on in five or 10 years as the best in, in Ice Dogs history. Statistically, it was, and, and the team success wasn't there. But as far as individual play, uh, I don't think you could ask anything more from the Ice Dogs 16-year-old uh, second overall pick from last year, Ryan Robrick. It just is is so crazy because the last four years have seemingly wiped out the decade before, which saw 
one of the better NHL drafted alumni teams. Like people are very quick to forget that Petra Angelo and Hamilton and Ryan Strom all were, were ice dogs. And I think that when you, and not to mention just before him, Akil Thomas, Phil Tomasino, yeah, Jason Robertson for, for a you know, part of a year. It's like, Ryan Robert broke a record that a lot of players that made the NHL weren't able to do. You know, we saw Akil Thomas make the NHL this year. And it's not to say that he is a slam dunk top five pick in the NHL draft, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. He's big. I think that um, what Stephen Ellis brought up about, you know, maybe, you know, um, skating, like just keeping his legs moving defensively and getting a little bit more ferocious on the forecheck. We saw as the year went along, he got a little chippier. And that could just be that he was 16 years old playing in the OHL. It's very tough to do. That's the thing that comes last usually. Um, but it, it's a very exciting time. I think that Ice Dog fans, uh, yeah, I think we we got to see something special last year. And because the team didn't do well, it was kind of not pushed under the rug. But I don't think it's getting talked about enough. Or And I think that in a couple of years, we're like, man, that rookie season was wild. 51 points with on the last place team as a 16 year old, right? Like, it's not like he had, he had, you know, musty feeding him the puck, you know, like, you know, or, or any, any of those guys, you know, it's not like that Oliver Bonk and, and Barky and all of them, like, you know, they was the last place team and he, he was a fantastic offensive force. So not to be forgotten, Carter Verhage playoff legend in the mm-hmm. national hockey league. Um, it's pretty incredible that he's tied Vince for the Dunn. most. I feel like our D our <laughs> defensive alumni stack up with every <clears throat> OHL franchise. It's pretty and we've there. only been around since 08. So like that needs to be mentioned because that starting, you know, that starting three is pretty solid. So as we wrap up, Cam, what's your prediction for Kevin? He, what round does he go in, in the NHL draft? Well, I am going to be a Homer here because I am a sharks fan. And the last time that the ice dogs had a player that was drafted in the mid rounds, technically wasn't part of the ice dogs yet was the Neil Gushkin. And he made the Sharks, or he drafted by the Sharks in the third round, and then he got drafted in the import draft afterwards, or right before. He never played a game with the Ice Dogs before he was drafted. But I'm a firm believer that NHL teams, if they draft a player from an organization, that they at least have an eye. And the Sharks have a lot of picks. Um, And, uh, hey, if he's a Shark, easy, easy jersey to go up on the wall. You know, (laughs) if he, if he, that's, that's an easy cop for me, but, um, I'm going to say I'm going to say the Sharks um it's so hard right like third and fourth round if that's where he's projected I think he goes late third round I I do I think that he goes late third round we saw the GM um or the I believe head coach or GM um the rankings where they rank all the players in the OHL for various things the GMs it was the GMs right they Kevin he was a top 3 skater of uh, as voted on by the GMs of the OHL not just like you know every team had a representative like Kevin got recognized by everyone as one of the better skaters in the league. And you heard Steven talk about how important that is, um, that that's something that, you know, can be taught, but if it's the strong point, like that carries you and not to mention he's bigger than you think, you know, like he's built pretty solid too, and he's only going to get bigger. So um, I'm going to say late third round, um, you know, just not Vegas. (laughs) I'm going to say fifth so that hopefully he goes in the fourth. In, okay, in, in, in I between. like that. I like that. I will be watching, which is honestly very fun, to, funny to do because you're basically sitting there. It's not on TV, and you're refreshing the website. That's basically how it goes. You or just you're refresh watching the website. this the, uh, the it ticker. go on TV. Yeah. Yep. Just the ticker go. I'm excited. I'm I'm very very excited. I have a vested interest this year. Uh, we've gotten to to talk and and hang out with Kevin quite a bit, especially the end of the season. Um, and he's just a nicest kid. And uh, I, I wish nothing but the best for him. And I want to see his name get called. It's uh, it's going to be fun as a fan, as a fan. It's going to be very fun. So as supporters of the Sharks, it's nice to see him beside Celebrini one day. But uh, we'll, let's we'll, go. Uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, that's going to wrap up our season finale episode of the Dog Pound podcast, Cam. Uh, thanks so much for coming on this year. I know it's been a couple a month or so before uh, since we did our last uh, draft episode there and wanted to come on and give you guys a uh, one final kind of farewell uh, send off into the off season, kind of give you an idea of what they're looking at going into uh, the trade season and things like that before we hop on uh, after training camp, uh, hoping for Kevin to get drafted in June. But uh, I know I speak for myself and I'm sure the listeners and viewers that we enjoyed having you uh, as the co-host this year. 
I really appreciate it, man. It's been a blast, uh, again, going from just being a fan and being at the game as a season ticket holder. Uh, it was awesome to hang out with you all year and, and talk ice dogs and get a, get a look that, you know, I wouldn't have had, um, had it not been for the opportunity. So for everyone listening that uh, put up with me all year, uh, I really appreciate it. And, uh, hopefully back and excited to get back into next season. Yeah. Thank you for your patience, uh, as we continue to grow and as the ice dogs continue to grow back up the standings, uh, such a passionate fan base. And we, we appreciate your support all year and also thank you to our great sponsor of the show global pet foods and all four of their great niagara region locations for everything they do for us this year uh the posters are all up in their uh, their stores as well as the proud supporters uh and show sponsor of the dog pound podcast so thank you very much to them as well so for cam halbert my name is brandon caputo that's been the uh, the full season here on the dog pound podcast and our season finale episode with special guest Stephen ellis thank you to everybody who listened to us today on your favorite on-demand audio platform and those who chose to listen uh, and watch us uh, on YouTube uh, with our glorious faces uh, all season long. So thank you very much. We'll have a great summer, and we'll talk to you again early in the fall for another great Ice Dog season He right here on the Dog Pound Podcast, the official podcast of your Niagara Ice Dogs. Take care, guys. You're listening to the Armchair GM Sports Network.